Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are in the world. This is Tim Collins, Secretary General of the International Stainless Steel Forum. Uh, and I'm grateful for everybody attending today to uh, our third webinar of this year, which is actually the first of three webinars uh, under the banner heading of Protecting People. And today I'm going to uh, undertake a presentation on water supply systems. Um, we've run this webinar already once earlier today for people in Europe and Asia. So this later session covers Europe again and the Americas. Um, so I trust everybody can see and hear Okay, we did a test before I started and, and that all looked good. Um, just a few starting comments from my side. So everybody attending the webinar will be emailed the presentation after the presentation session is finished. So you don't need to necessarily take notes. You will be supplied with the presentation. The presentation along with my commentary will also be placed on YouTube so you'll be able to relook at it at your leisure and also um, presentation time will be about 40 to 45 minutes which will leave an opportunity for questions at the end now any questions we don't get an opportunity to answer in the q a session will be responded to by email after the webinar today so all questions will be answered and if anybody has additional questions they consider after the webinar, they can also be emailed directly to myself. My email address is on the, uh, the first banner page here. So as I said, the presentation will be sent out, so you'll have reference to that in due course. So if everybody's uh, sitting comfortably, we'll uh, start the presentation. So the agenda for today comprises a short introduction just to set the scene of the topic we're talking about and the key issues we'll be discussing then to reflect on a simple scenario that highlights the challenges we're dealing with then to look specifically at water losses um, where they're occurring and perhaps why they occur as well and then we'll move on to look at leaks and leak detection before a shift into what is titled different thinking and this is where the introduction of stainless steels comes really into the presentation and then we'll wrap up the session with a short few slides covering life cycle costing how it looks and why it's important and then i'll summarize the key features at the end before running into the q a session so i trust that's okay for everybody so we'll start with the introduction and start with a couple of sort of uh, compelling statistics. So currently, every day that passes, about 90 million cubic meters of water is lost. And this is water that has been treated for uh, consumption in either offices, in residential homes, etc., and never makes it to the point of consumption. And that's a quite frightening statistic. Well, you can actually translate that into something that's perhaps a bit more easier to understand. It's the equivalent of 36,000 Olympic sized swimming pools. And that's enough water that's lost every day to sustain the needs of 400 million people on the earth. So it's a phenomenal amount of water that gets processed and never makes it. Now, if we accept that water is a precious and scarce resource, do we actually consider it every day in this way? Because if we always have water each and every time we demand it, do we actually ever stop and think about the water that never reaches us? And I guess the answer is probably no, because it's hidden. We don't see the losses and what's probably even more concerning is that 
about half the heavily water reliant global industries all over the world are sitting in areas that are designated as high water stress risk. And as we move fo forward over the next 30 years, climate change is only going to exacerbate those industry risks. So we have a situation that is unfolding on us now that is going to be quite frightening in terms of water supply and how we can manage our water supply effectively. But I'd also like to just reflect on something from earlier this year, which was World Water Day held on the 22nd of March. And these bullet points here are statements from the Secretary General of the OECD uh, made on World Water Day. And I think people will probably, when sort of looking at these statements, uh, accept that this is the reality. Um, the impact of climate change is now being felt throughout the water cycle, and that's particularly evident when we see the increasing severity of both droughts and floods and the associated increasing frequency. And we know that that has a very poor effect on people's livelihoods, but also their well-being. Now, when you think about that and then put on top of that, the demand for water will increase by over 50% over the next 30 years. And during that time, <clears throat> around 40% of the world's population are expected to be living in water-stressed river basins. We can't sit back and do nothing. So we have to take some strong action on water supplies, but also strong action on climate change. And this will require collective efforts. This is not business only efforts. This goes beyond that and looks at governmental and administrative efforts uh, to support businesses to deliver the right actions. But if we don't come together within 30 years, we'll be in a devastating situation. So there's a few provocative thoughts there, but I don't think when they're laid out quite clearly, thoughts that we wouldn't necessarily disagree with. Now, so that sets the scene. If we now try and put things in context with a very simple scenario. So if you consider your own family car and you fill it with fuel every week, and if we use, for example, 100 euros or $100 of fuel each and every week, if due to a leak in the fuel tank of the car, approximately 30 euros or $30 of that spilled onto the highways every week, would we just sit back and say, hey, that's okay. Let's do nothing, let's not worry. You know, it's okay, over a year, we, we put in almost 1,600 euros or $1,600 of fuel and we get no benefit for that. So of course, our answer would be no, because that's hitting us in many ways. But this is what happens to our water supplies. About 30% of the water that is treated never makes it to the point of usage. And this is a hidden problem. We don't naturally see it. And when you convert those treated water leakages into a cost, the estimated cost across the globe is about $14 billion a year. And that cost is essentially passed on to consumers for something they never get. So there's a number of issues that surround this interesting parallel, that we're paying for water that never reaches us. There's a lot of disruption and hassle that the water utilities companies have as a result of this, and yet the situation is not improving. So are water losses truly a hidden problem? If we start by looking at treated water leakage rates across a selection of major cities and this graph has the cities shown on the on the x-axis on the bottom and the percentage of treated water that never reaches the point of usage shown on the x-axis on the y-axis sorry on the left hand side and the world-class level for this is set at 
2.5%. Uh, so that is a world-class performance level. And on this chart, only two cities meet that world-class level, being Tokyo in Japan and Seoul in, in South Korea. There's a few other cities that are not far away, but equally, there are many that are a long way off. And you can see how this builds uh, across this group of cities to some quite frightening losses when you move into, uh, into South America. So this is quite a staggering statistic of the size of the problem we're really dealing with. Now you can present this data in a slightly different way. The same losses, but now plotted against uh, gross domestic product for the city expressed in dollars per capita. And there is a sort of relationship here, but a lot of outliers. So we have to just be careful with how we assess this data. What is broadly interesting is that as the city wealth increases, broadly, the water losses decrease but very few of them get down to the, the world-class level. And there are many interesting outliers that you perhaps would not expect on this chart. And those above the arbitrary blue dotted trend line um, are quite an interesting selection of cities, some that you may well have chosen had you been asked without seeing the graph and some that you probably wouldn't at all. So it is an interesting reflection of how uh, variable the system that we have for supplying water is currently. But also we have to think about the water delivery systems and in many locations around the world plastic pipe work is, is commonplace yet it is not as resilient as we perhaps expect and even though this material should last a good 50 years, five zero, visible degradation is present after around 15 years. And that leads to water leakages in quite inaccessible locations and causes a major problem for repair teams. But the problem doesn't end there. Joints in pipework systems are genuine weak points and most of the leakages occur in, in joints. And that shouldn't be a complete surprise, but we have a lot of joints in our systems all over the world. Furthermore, when we choose to work with uh, metal and alloy pipe work, uh, there are situations where we use dissimilar metals together and that encourages leakages through what's known as galvanic corrosion. So dissimilar metals uh, create a galvanic cell which causes corrosion and ultimately causes leakages. So again, that's not a good process in terms of building our supply systems. So from a water loss perspective, I think it is fair to say, and there's one or two provocative statements on this slide, by and large, we install water supply systems based on designs that will ultimately fail. And that's not a criticism of installation practices. This is just a feature of the choice of materials and the design of the system with all the joints they tend to have. I would argue equally, we don't select the best material choice for the pipe work because so many of our uh, organizations are largely guided by material acquisition costs first and foremost. And the ongoing maintenance costs are not considered up front. We also stick the pipe work underground, so we're hiding the future problems. And that obviously creates other challenges in terms of leak detection and then the ongoing repairs that are needed. And in terms of the material that is frequently selected, these material types both create microparticulate contaminants in the pipe work, which gets into our water supplies, but is also porous to hydrocarbons like spilled diesel oil. So some other hygienic concerns there. And whilst there are many reasons for water leakages, joints in the pipework systems are the overriding weak point. And that's been well established for, for some years now. So if we move forward and consider now leak detection, 
there's no doubt that leak detection and repair is truly big business. Lots of organisations involved in this, either undertaking the work or creating the devices that detect leaks in pipelines. And there are many methods to repair leaking pipes. But I think the right question to ask here is, do we believe this is the right way to operate, that leaks are inevitable, or should we rethink that? And if you consider a very different perspective, a vascular surgeon, he has one opportunity, he or she, I should say, has one opportunity to deliver a reliable fix to the patient. And the consequences of not delivering a reliable fix can be devastating. So when you're faced with that type of challenge, the approach will be somewhat different. And why should it not be for our water supplies? If we can select the most appropriate materials, we can minimise leaks or perhaps even eliminate them. So I think this is an opportunity where we can turn things around, have a different start point. But if we just reflect on detecting leaks and managing leaks, and here's just an interesting sort of contrast. If we had a choice about how many leaks we had to manage in a, an urban environment per day, would we choose 125 leaks per day or just 25, one fifth of that? And this is the relative difference between what exists typically today in a major urban environment and what can exist with a different water delivery system. And I would equally argue that having around 125 leaks per day to deal with just imposes firefighting as a mode of operation. Every day is chaotic. The pressure to fix things never goes away. And is this the right way to operate? Is this an accepted business norm? Do we believe that leaks are just inevitable and we have to get on with it? Are we driven by short term is thinking and even uh, a contract culture where we're not looking beyond the next two to three years. Is our thinking too traditional? We've always had it this way, so why change? When we're in this form of chaotic work, do we never get the opportunity to look up and look around because we're just too busy fixing problems? So if we could start again with a blank piece of paper, what would we choose to do? So if we really want to eliminate leaks, we must start from a different position. And I would argue there's a number of simple questions we should be asking. What is the primary mode of failure today? Can we eliminate or significantly reduce that mode of failure? What is the most appropriate solution to, de to deliver zero leaks? And then we need to assess both the benefits and weaknesses of that solution and work hard to minimise the weaknesses. And I would propose that in trying to minimise weaknesses, there are three interesting areas to focus on. Choice of materials, how the material is processed to provide the right solution, and ensuring that the material that then arrives at the installation site is easy to work with. And that's all things that can help in the process of moving away from leaks as a norm. Now, there's another way of looking at this with a simple thought process map. And this is just a typical example, but to walk through it, if we start in the top left-hand corner, identify where most leaks occur. We know from evidential experience, it's really at the fittings in the last meters of pipework from the main supply pipework to the property. So the first question is, can we eliminate or reduce the number of fittings? Can we take away the biggest source of problem? Yes, we can. And the solution or one solution to this would be to develop bendable pipes, pipes that don't have joints and fittings. And in order to facilitate that at the site, could we bend the pipes on the site by hand? Of course, that is possible but it will depend on the material 
chosen and the pipe forming process. And in answer to that, uh, a technique called hydroforming, which can apply heart corrugations to pipes, will allow the bending of even metal and alloy pipes by hand. So gives the operators extreme flexibility when it comes to installation. And then what material would be the right choice of material for this flexible pipe? Well, of course, for somebody representing the stainless steel industry, we're going to say stainless steel. That goes with, without uh, any doubt. But I would equally argue that with stainless steel, you can have a combination of st a strong and lightweight product, something that is hygienic and corrosion resistance, and something that allows multiple bending without any risk of failure. So a very flexible product. So to sum up leaks and leak detection, I think it's fair to say that detection and repair has become the norm. But if almost one third of our treated water doesn't get to the point of usage, and this is the current global average for urban environments, and this approach creates significant greenhouse gas emissions because we're treating water that doesn't get used, then if there's an opportunity to think differently, why do we not choose that? And I should reflect on that and say, when you're thinking about metal and alloy pipework systems, there is uh, an ease to detect the leaks because of the type of sound they emit. That's not to say that other materials don't emit sound, but leak detection with metal and alloy pipework tends to be simpler. So if you can reduce the leaks and take away the firefighting, it's e you have an easier to manage problem with what is left. Now, at this point, I'd like to sort of shift gears and propose some different thinking where we can consider a solution that will last for more than 100 years. And this is where I'm proposing that stainless has an important role to play. And we have some wonderful examples already in existence, three lighthouse cities, as we term them, who have made the switch to stainless. And that is Tokyo in Japan, Seoul in South Korea, and Taipei in Taiwan. And the basic notion is it's about fit and forget. And on the left-hand side of this slide, you can see a part picture of the corrugated pipework. So rather than having joints uh, at the bends in the pipework, they're just bent to fit between the saddle on the main water supply uh, system, which would be off to the left of this picture, and then into the coupling into the property on the right hand side. So a much simpler and elegant design. But why would we choose stainless? I think there's a number of features that spring to mind. Stainless steels are highly corrosion resistant and they don't impart metallic tastes on, on water and other foodstuffs. And that's because they have a corrosion resistant passive film, an invisible film that sits on the surface. And if for any reason it gets damaged, it's self repaired. And because of that, stainless steels don't promote bacteria growth or residue development or even biofilms in the pipework. And they will last for at least 100 years without the need for replacement. Uh, we can't say much more than 100 years yet because the industry is only 107 years old. So we have to be mindful of that. But equally, from a th thinking about stainless perspective, these easy to bend part corrugated pipes can be quite easily produced. Uh, they've been produced many years for, uh, for the automotive industry. And that both simplifies and speeds up the installation process. And when you choose stainless, installation programs can be phased in over time, but the benefits come immediately. And one of the key benefits is the massive reduction in maintenance costs because you're working with a material that is truly fit and forget. And when you get to the end of life, you have a fully recyclable material to deal with. So there's many positive credentials that are associated with stainless steels. 
But I think it's also fair to sort of just reflect on water losses and compare traditional water supply systems in this first chart showing, and I'll compare that to stainless in a moment. So in this waterfall diagram, we have on the left-hand side, the available water in a reservoir. And let's just assume it's 100% of our needs. And we put the water through a series of, of steps. And this is a simplistic diagram just to make a point. So we have the treatment step, the trunk supply, and then what I call the last meter supply before usage. And in our traditional systems, you have some very small losses in the upstream processes, and then the last meter supply is where the bulk of the treated water losses occur. And then you get into the usage components, so property usage that ultimately flows into aquifers and property usage that flows into sewerage systems. Very simple and easy to understand overview. Now, if you then contrast that with a stainless steel water supply system, the thing that changes here is the last meter supply losses. They diminish massively. And that means you have more water available for use. So really, this transition has an instant hit in terms of you don't need the same amount of water to support the needs of your population because you're losing less. Now let's look at a couple of the, the reference cities. And this chart is the data from Tokyo in Japan. Excuse me, and there are three lines on the chart. So we have a, a representative percentage on the y-axis and the timeline on the x-axis, starting in this case in 1980, running up to 2014. And you can see from the green line that in Tokyo's case, it took them quite many years to go from no stainless to 100% stainless water supply pipe work. And during that time, their water leakage rates fell from around 16%. So this wasn't a horrible picture to 2% over the term of this. And the repairs at the same time fell from about 70,000 per annum, which is about 190 repairs per day down to 10,000 repairs per annum, which is 25 per day. So a massive shift in that case. And there's a huge cost saving that comes with not having to undertake that level of repairs. So two massive benefits here. If we then compare that to the experience in Seoul in South Korea, it's the same sort of chart, slightly different looking. So the issues here were that Seoul had approaching 30% of water losses, and they got down by 2014 to a little over 2% of water losses. They had less repairs to undertake. So 45,000 a year is equivalent to 125 repairs per day, and 10,000, as we've mentioned previously, is about 25 repairs per day. The buildup of stainless pipe work is a slightly different profile and reached about 90% uh, in uh, 2008. <laughs> so you can see here how, again, getting over a critical threshold in terms of stainless pipe work drove the leakage rates, particularly and the repair rates, down significantly. Now, it's interesting when you put this data with some additional um, numbers from the two cities side by side. And I'm not going to describe every element on this slide in, in detail. You can read that at your leisure later. But what's interesting is if we look at the top at the initial and final leakage rates, and you can see the changes both in percentage terms and in volume of water terms. So a significant shift downwards there. You can also see the shift in repairs per annum um, from the red numbers to the green numbers. And then as you move into the midsection, you can see the financial savings, and these are not small numbers at all. So for Tokyo, 4 billion US dollars over 34 years, and for Seoul in South Korea, approaching 5 billion US dollars over 27 years. And that is based on a water cost of one US dollar per meter cubed. What's also interesting in this is that 
because of the need to treat less water, there's an associated and significant reduction in CO2 emissions from the water treatment system, uh, which is equally impressive. Um, there were also uh, other benefits that were identified through this change. Uh, for Tokyo and Japan, that was a proven resistance to seismic shocks, certainly up to and including nine on the Richter scale. And in Seoul in South Korea, a massive reduction in needed water treatment plants. So 40% of the water treatment plants could be closed. So some true and impressive benefits here. But I mentioned at the start, there was a third city in this process. So it would be just useful to reflect on Taipei in Taiwan, which had a slightly different challenge here as well, on top of the leakage rates. So in Taipei, as the annual rainfall level was actually falling, they were running out of water. And certainly back around the time of 2002, there was a period of about 60 days where there was no water supply to the city. And that's quite a frightening position for a major city to find itself in. <clears throat> and at that time, the reservoir storage on average was less than 60% of, of capacity which when you look at the variation throughout a year meant there were times when the reservoir system was empty. So in Taipei's case, they had two features to address. One, to deal with the falling level of annual rainfall and how to manage that, and also to take away the high proportion of network leakages, which stood at just over 28% when the program started. And with the installation and their start here was a very targeted installation of, of stainless because they had leaks in specific districts. So they went very quickly for replacing a little over a third of the pipework with stainless steel. And that allowed them, whilst the rainfall levels were falling year on year, to increase their reservoir storage capacity to over 90% by 2014, which meant then they were not running out of water, even with the reduced rainfall. And during that period from the start of the project in the early 2000s to 2014, almost a 12% fall in network leakages, which again is very impressive. So there's another feature to be considered in this example, and I think it makes compelling reading alongside the other two experiences too. But it's also useful just to focus on some headline guidance numbers when undertaking this work, because there's a few other features that need to be put in perspective and considered. And one of them is the installation cost, because people will know by and large stainless steels are not a, a cheap product. So approximately 100,000 people of population, the cost to, to buy and install and create an operational stainless pipework system, it's about 80 million US dollars. And that's based on the Tokyo and Seoul experiences. And bear in mind, these are guidance numbers. Every city is different. So these are just guidelines. Now, the break-even installation proportion of stainless out of total service pipework for these examples was about 45%. So once you'd hit 45%, the total cost of installation um, and the total savings were about equal. And the time to get to that position was 10 years in, in each of these cities' cases. But once you've hit that break-even position and recognize it will be somewhat different for each city, for every 1% of stainless proportion above that, you're getting something of the order of 150 million US dollars of savings. And when you reach 90% stainless service pipe work, you're approaching 7 billion US dollars of savings, and this is per year. So these are huge numbers once you've got over the, the break even threshold for this. So there is a massive payback to be had by making these changes, but it's a longer term game. You can't consider this as a short term option. 
So to summarise this section on different thinking, I would argue that stainless steels do provide a compelling alternative to traditional water pipe work materials. We have three major cities, albeit all in Asia, that have switched to stainless steel with absolutely stunning results. And they've accommodated other features, not just the removal of uh, water leakage and losses and the associated maintenance, but the use of stainless accommodates seismic disruptions and falling rainfall levels in those areas. And equally, should we just continue to accept that 30% of our treated water never gets to the point of usage, particularly when we have a scarce resource now? I would argue that the financial savings are highly compelling and we can't overlook that. And the elimination of greenhouse gases uh, in terms of the emissions, particularly from the treatment plants, are equally compelling here. So, in summary, what is not to like about stainless steels in this sort of application? Well, the thing that hits home each and every time is material cost. And that's what I'd like to look at next in this presentation. So now we move on to life cycle costing. This is a quick walk through with an example of life cycle costing for uh, stainless steel and competing materials. So first and foremost, life cycle costing supports sustainable thinking and it avoids any of us falling into the historical trap of lowest cost bids, win contracts, and maintenance is somebody else's problem. Life cycle costing also allows us to think long term. So we can consider service lives of above 100 years. And I would argue there are some fundamental needs that fall into that category. Water supply systems being one, large infrastructure projects being another, and certainly coastal structures to protect our land uh, all fall into this category. And in using life cycle costing, we can think about materials that we may have otherwise discounted in the old way of thinking. And it's also fair to say that life cycle thinking positively supports greenhouse gas reductions. And today, about 9% of our global greenhouse gas emissions result from road traffic, of which 1% is due to standing traffic around infrastructure repair points, where there are often delays in flows to, to traffic. And that's quite a significant issue. And I know that's to do with all reasons, not just water supplies, but that's the magnitude uh, that repairs to infrastructure sort of has in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. So if we think about now the components of life cycle costing, there are broadly four components. The acquisition costs, which is the cost of securing the materials or products for a specific project or installation, including delivery to the installation site. The installation costs, which are the cost of taking those materials or products and turning them into an operational concept. Then the ongoing maintenance costs, which is the cost associated with maintaining the installation to deliver an acceptable level of operation. And then the fourth component, which may or may not apply in some cases, is an income from the sales or end of life recycling of the materials used. And that's cash generated from either sales associated with the concept of which there are possibilities there, or as I said, recycling at end of operational life. And if we think about water supply systems, particularly as we're considering longevity 100 years plus, I'd like now to focus on the, the first three elements, which is where we can really apply those elements to water supply systems. So first and foremost, the headline numbers, and then I'll show how they're made up. So here we're looking at stainless steel versus polyethylene um, versus PVC. And this is based on a four metre long installation from a main supply pipe to a property with the necessary fittings. And over 100 years of service life, stainless steel option is significantly lower in cost than the other two options. And if I now move to the next slide, you can see how that is then made up. So we have three 
charts side by side here showing that buildup of life cycle costs. And for stainless steel, the green section, which is the acquisition cost, the material acquisition costs, you can see is much higher than that for polyethylene and PVC. And we wouldn't at all be surprised by that. Um, but then when you look at the installation costs, you see that stainless steel is a, a little cheaper because now you have the use of the flexible pipe work, the reduction in number of couplings and, and fit, fittings. So it's a much easier um, process to undertake. And then you get to the big win, the game changer, which is maintenance costs, which remains very high for polyethylene and PVC because of the need to replace materials after they're failed. But for stainless, it's much, much lower. Uh, and that's where really stainless makes the difference that whilst you get a small benefit in installation, you get a massive benefit in terms of ongoing maintenance costs. And it really is back to that notion of fit and forget. However, we know today there are some people that avoid or bypass life cycle cost thinking. And there are many reasons given. Uh, probably the most common is it's quite difficult to get the comparative data and there is no doubt it is a little harder but once you have it you don't have to renew it for every uh, new opportunity or contract the data is valid and good for a few years there's also the notion that hey this is difficult to understand well the basics of life cycle costing are not difficult to understand there are people that make it difficult but once you've got the concept in your head and you understand how to work with it, it is a much more straightforward and easy way to think about things. I've often had it said to me, you know, we're not going to look at it this way. My boss doesn't believe in life cycle costing, but we should take every day as an opportunity to learn and educate somebody. And life cycle costing goes hand in hand with sustainability. So it will start to invade all aspects of how we think about new developments. Equally, many people have said, hey, our current solution works really well. We know what we're doing with this. We're good at this. You can't argue or criticize that. But over time, good companies do go bad because their previous successes blind them from future successes. They hang on to the old successes and the old ways of doing things. And the question I'd ask here is, do you want to be a market follower or a market leader? Ultimately, it's the business's choice, but sticking as a follower will not always help. And lastly in this list, and it's not an exhaustive list, people often say, well, hey, my client is not demanding life cycle costing, and that may be true today, but it will change quite quickly because more and more people are demanding life cycle costing information. So we can't sit our eyes and expect this to go away. It's here to say. So we shouldn't bypass life cycle costing thinking. So in terms of summarizing life cycle costing, it's important that we lose our short sightedness and we think holistically. We need to think life cycle costing for all new projects and all new installations in order to dispel those urban myths. In other words, stainless steel is expensive. Yes, it is, but it brings other benefits. We need to understand where the majority of the money goes in our contracts. We need to look from birth to death, from cradle to grave. And we need to get the information to allow us to make clear judgments and decisions. And that's moving away from just the material acquisition and installation costs. Maintenance is an important feature. So I'd now like to wrap up the presentation with just a short summary. I think we can happily accept that water is a scarce and precious resource. Equally, that climate change is adversely impacting on our water cycle. And if we don't act jointly and together, we won't be able to use water wisely. We need to move away from short term thinking for our water supply systems. Otherwise, we will not fix the problems we have now. We need to shift to a water delivery system that is both reliable and resilient. We must therefore think differently and without short sightedness. And I would argue we should think stainless. And 
the final point on this slide is if more than 100 million US dollars per annum of financial savings is not compelling enough based on our large city experience, then I really don't know what is. We have the opportunity to make some significant savings and we should be doing that. And just before I look, launch into the question and answer session, just some closing words from the Director of Water Distribution in Seoul, in South Korea. As we expected, stainless steel pipes have contributed to cleaner water quality and longer service life than other materials. Furthermore, the corrugated sections contributed to an improved workability and a decrease in leakage. And I think that's a nice reflection of the benefits you get from installing this type of system. And it's good that that's recognised in the cities that have adopted this. So at that point, I'd like to thank you for your attention, end the presentation, but now move into the opportunity for people to ask questions. Joe, do we have any questions today? Not so far, but if they raise their hands, I'll turn on their microphones. Okay, so if anybody wants to ask a question verbally, you have the opportunity to, uh, to raise your hands or, or you can equally place a question in the chat facility. There's probably a lot to think about in this presentation. Yes, there's a lot of information, a few provocative thoughts and statements, I'm sure. But as I said at the start, if anybody wants to uh, pitch a question by email when they've had a chance to digest all this, they would be most welcome to do that and uh, questions will be thoroughly responded to uh, in as email replies. Ah, there's a question now. Okay. Okay, somebody raised their hand, but try to unmute, but it's self-muted. Okay, thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I was muted on both sides. Uh, this is Do Hongel speaking, Columbus Stainless uh, in South Africa. Uh, Tim, I was just wondering, in those lighthouse cities where the studies were done and the figures come from, are we talking now stainless steel only then for the final distribution um what about the bulk supply infrastructure uh, the, the material choice there how far upstream in the supply uh, are we talking of stainless steel replacement so we're really talking stainless steel replacement and thank you for the the question because it's a very pertinent question in the pipe work that goes from the main supply so the wide bore pipe to the property and that is based on uh, evidential experience that the traditional systems over that relatively short distance which is typically between four and ten meters in length uh, has historically been full of joints and fittings and that's where the failures or the leakages have occurred and in the lighthouse cities that those were the changes that were made taking that last few meters of supply converting it to stainless with minimal joints and the problems really diminished so it was really about targeting the big losses not necessarily all the losses does that answer your question thank you yes um and then just another question I was considering the uh, corrugated pipe work that is used for that final four odd meters of installation um, in what format is it supply or how is the final sizing done obviously at some point it has to be cut to length and there will be a joint on both sides is it um, does it re resemble what we see on the image now and then supplied in in a way that it is maybe Coiled in that format, or is it um, pre cut sections of five, six meters? How is the final sizing done for installation? 
Okay, so it's generally supplied in uh, in single lengths. So if, for example, you had a, a distance from the the saddle, if I can just go back up a moment, so you can see the full diagram now on screen. So you have the main supply pipe work on on the left, with the saddle around that and the tapped in connector. You have one joint here and then a length of part corrugated pipe work up to the point of the meter at the property now if that distance as a linear distance was let's say six meters and the standard lengths of pipe work supplied were four uh, six seven and eight meters for example um then it might be appropriate to choose a seven meter piece and just flex that to fit perfectly in there without the need for cutting it so the advantage of the flexible pipework is the pipework lengths can be standardized but then the pipework itself can be just flexed at the point of installation by hand to make a very quick fit each and every time so it's lengths, not coils. Thank you very much. Okay. Th thank you, thank you. Um, there's another question here, Tim. Yeah. Um, it says, how is the biofilm growth impacted by the stainless steel pipe versus PE or PVC? Well, stainless steels, and certainly there's been some research on this uh, undertaken in, in South Korea. Um, there is no biofilm growth uh, visible even after uh, long periods of, of usage. So pipe work has been put in situ, under the ground, used for many years, taken back out and inspected, uh, and there is no detrimental growth. And, and this is, even around the corrugated sections, it's fair to say, um, and this is fundamentally down to the sort of hygienic properties, particularly the passive film existing on stainless steels. So, this is one of the very um, beneficial features of choosing stainless steels for this application. Thank you, Tim. Um, so far, no more questions. Let's give it another go. Anybody has more que another question, please raise your hand or use the chat function. No more questions coming in? No, nope, nothing. Okay, so for the people that have pitched the questions, thank you very much. Um, I hope the answers were complete enough to, uh, to provide a good answer to your questions. But as I said at the start, if anybody has any additional questions or wants further clarification, please do not hesitate to, to send an email and that everything will be responded to. Um, so finally, I'd like to thank everybody for their attention, uh, for the questions, and uh, I wish you a good rest of the day wherever you are. Take care. Thank you very much.